Welcome back to the Path Talk Show. Today I have an exciting guest who is a Guinness World Record holder in 2023. He's an ex-military and diplomatic intelligence. He is also a best-seller author, business owner, podcaster, and he's written two books, which is What is True Price of Freedom and Blood Soaked Soil. Welcome, Mario. Oh, thank you, Justin, for having me on your podcast today. Really appreciate it. I appreciate you coming down and uh, to your studio, of course. Thank you for the promotions. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, I, you know, I, I love, I love talking to you. Like, seriously, it's a Saturday today, and today it's a great day um, to be out, right? You know, people are gonna be on, on the beaches. They're gonna enjoy the times, everything else. But look at you and I today here in studio. That makes me extremely happy. Extremely, extremely happy. So, yeah, appreciate very much for having you on your podcast. No problems, and it does take great sacrifice. So I was just wondering about the beginning of your journey mm. because obviously you weren't born here, you were born in Croatia. Mm. Give us a little bit of an insight where you first begun. Look, I could start with my um, sad story like everybody else, you know. You know, I grew up there, I grew up this. I grew up in a society which I didn't choose, it's communism, it's given to me by birth. Society with, where we all supposed to be equal and you know brothers and sisters, but it's it's nothing like that. Communism, it's nothing what people think it is. Communism, it's uh, beyond um, anybody understanding. So I was born in 1972, and um, we have the Marshal Tito. Now he was our leader. You know, what I mean, just you know, everything was there for us, ready. You know, we we just need to understand the sacrifices of generations before us. And uh, I go with that part, but then somehow down the track, as you can see, my my physical appearance, you know, I wasn't always good looking, sexy man like today. <laughs> I was always chubby, you know, I was um, always on receiving end, right? I mean, my parents spent more money on uh, drinking, and, you know, my mom, she was a kleptoman, she was stealing from other people. Mm. But I had a great grandfather. Uh, grandfather was more father role than anything else. He was the second in charge of secret police in Yugoslavia, so he was a high position communist official. And he tried to correct my, you know, my path, because <laughs> he was afraid I'll end up in a prison, which at age 12, I stabbed a man with a screwdriver uh, oh, wow. twice, yeah, I end up in Jewy. And uh, my grandfather told me, I don't know what we're going to do with you. My father kicked me out uh, at age 14 on Christmas Eve, 1986. And my grandfather says to me, nobody wants you. Like, there's no there's no future for you. Like, you know what I mean? You're doing the boxing with all these criminals. You're bashing other people, you're stealing, you know I mean? You're stabbing, you know, you're in a jewelry. <laughs> Your parents doesn't want you. So he... he influences so much he put all his reputation and beg people to i be admitted to military school in you know what i mean so that's a that's a cream de la cream of society military mm. in communism and um yeah i always wanted to be a soldier wow and do you always found like your grandfather was that main mentor in your life where he gave you that guidance even though you went through that journey of stabbing someone with a screwdriver mm. But he was the one that was always there for you when everyone else left you. You know, the funny thing is, like, every time when I walk with my grandfather, it was like, he was like a Moses, right? The, the people just move like this on the two sides, you know what I mean? I said to myself, why everybody is, like, you know, afraid of my grandfather? And everybody's like, good morning, comrade Mato, good morning, comrade Mato. And, like, my grandfather, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, um, so I think that he saw the failure with his own children, which is including my mom. Uh, she was a kleptoman, everything else. So he tried to influence somehow my part. And um, he always, he told me, I don't want you to be in intelligence services. I don't want you to be the spy. And I never understood actually what that means. But eventually I'd become the, you know, I mean, all of this above, um, even in military intelligence and diplomatic intelligence. But when the war broke out, 1991, you know, I was 18 years old. I was in love, met in love with that girl. You know, we I, we organized our life, you know, forever. You're going to have kids. We're going to live here. We're going to live there. We're going to do this. You know, going to be the officer in the army. You're going to do this. It turns out that when the war broke out, uh, 1991, in July 14, I never forget, 
my girlfriend dumped me night before. You know, I me mean? wow. literally, <laughs> literally dumped me. She says to me, "You're my enemy." Yo, know, that's like, what do you mean, your enemy? So I'm the Croat. How did that make a, you feel when she said that? Uh, sad, sad. I couldn't understand. You know, what I mean, because we brought in in society where we the nationalism was not a, was not welcomed. Um, but somehow, you know, Balkans are very, very heated. You know, it's a it's a keg powder. You know, what I mean, mm. <laughs> it's like a, just explosion after explosion. So I remember the night before I was chasing her, um, tried to see her, but she they, they crossed the border between Croatia and Serbia into Serbia. I was drunk, and in the morning, I don't know I can't remember. Maybe nine, ten o'clock. Somebody on the door said, "Who the fuck is on the door now?" Like I'm so drunk, and I mean, still, you know, what I mean, I see that my my knuckles and bloody, and I mean, everything's like, what the fuck? I say, where's my pants? And that's how my story started. You know, I mean, I opened the door. There is a military police, Comrade Mato, report to the army barracks right now. I said, oh, I'm not sure. You know, I'm gonna be officer soon. Yeah, we don't give a fuck. Anyway, so my parents left me message on a kitchen table. We are okay. So they run out night before. My my mom, my dad, my brother, wow. they gone. And, um, you know, I just said, I need to have a coffee because I don't know what's happening, right? And I can see on a street hundreds of cars packing the stuff. Some people that put in the sticky tape on the windows, the sandbags. And I'm like, what? It's like a surreal, you know what I mean? Like It, it does. does. <laughs> I can't even comprehend <laughs> what you've experienced there mm. because obviously I never got to experience that minus like breaking up with your girlfriend. I think we've all yeah, been to that yeah, stage. Yeah. But <laughs> not to the point where like a day before you go to the military and you experience the things you have. But when you started in the military, from where you were when you started... How did you see yourself evolve over time when you're in the military? In those times of crisis as well. Look, I always wanted to be the soldier, right? I knew that I want to be the soldier, but I knew that I have no grades to become soldier, right? Um, not even NCO. So I thanks to my grandfather and he's become my guardian. So you need, somebody needs to sign the papers for you that you know, in, in case if you fail in military school, you know, someone needs to pay that. That's the government, right? <laughs> My grandfather signed it and, you know, he told me he had nowhere to go, right? So then I wanted to have the war. I said to people, be careful what you wish for. Mm. The war come on a big door, not a small door, like a big door. Because I remember that day when 14th of July, 1991, I was walking downstairs in a coffee shop. So I'm talking, I was 18 years old, you know what I mean? I was considered a grown-up. Right? Yeah, and uh, I saw these criminals from my street. You know, what I mean, only them. There's no alpha males. There's no A grade students. Nobody. They're already gone. So like, it looks like I wake up from the from from the winter dream. You know, sleep whatever you want to call. I like, what's happened to the last twenty four hours? You know. Anyway, would you say it's similar to, but nothing like what happened there? Like when everything went to lockdown and everyone had to stay home, mm. was it like a surreal experience similar to that? Minus like obviously you're about to go to battle. We had the first lockdown in April 1986 when Chernobyl happened. Uh, I remember as a kids like we were <laughs> we were on the street and suddenly it starts snowing. You know what I mean? Like mm. so it's the snow, and then you can see that all these alarms, sirens, sirens, and everything. <laughs> Like what the f you know, there was no internet then, you know, there's nothing. And then you can hear the uh what's it called? Because in communism, what we had, we have to always practice for the war. Everything was every Sunday, midday, all uh siren sirens in the city need to be tested. People have the lunch okay, wow. you know. But that day was a midweek. Was uh, alarms and sirens and all these things and military street in the, in the husband suits and so what the you know go inside so we were being locked about seven days and can you imagine being with your parents seven days only one channel on TV I'm like come on man that's crazy yeah um but 
then 91, the lockdowns here in Sydney were, we were not bad. What I saw in Victoria, that was that was brutal over there. That was literally brutal, and that was uh, sadistic. In I mean, like I never saw something like this in my life. I never yeah, saw. I, agree, I have yeah. the friends overseas. You know, uh, particularly lockdowns in 2021 didn't exist in Europe anymore. In Australia, was still pushing that agenda, and I never understood like this is not healthy. In a war, you have the freedom. How to mm. say? You still can move. I you gonna see my you gonna read in my book. My grandfather was a diabetic, so my parents ran away. His other kids ran away. So it's only me left. You know, I mean, to take care of him and his wife. You know, she's not my grandmother, but I could say has a grandmother. She was nice person uh, rose and uh, i need to run to bring him uh, the insulin you know i mean um because on those days insulin you need to bring the like it's it's like a like a glass bottle and syringe and they need to inject themselves right yeah so i used to be running and i mean it was empty street there was no cars there's no people it's always gray it's middle of the summer it was gray there's you see, it's a green leaves, but it's gray. The, the the smell of explosion, the burns, the the, the body parts, everywhere, bricks. You know, I mean, and you know, I was running. I remember from. I was saying to myself, if I run diagonally, I'll not be hit by the mortar, right? Mm. Or if I go straight, I'm gonna be hit by something, by the sniper or whatever it is. So I need to run between the buildings to come to the building when my grandfather in basement it is to bring him insulin from the from my military doctor but my grandfather was not welcome no because he was representing the the that dirt of the communism right yeah but then somehow i appear and i become war hero very early and as i was running that's what i try to say you know i mean diagonally between the between the buildings you can hear in the background, boom, 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 and you know that they start shelling the city. And then you can hear the first <laughs> covering. And then you, I'm just lying on a ground, on a road. There's nothing around me, just a road. It's asphalt. You're waiting to, and I see the insulin, you know, it's rolled out of my hand. I need to run, you know, to bring my grandfather. So I owe him a lot. He was disappointed that uh, when he heard that I'm going into military security intelligence services, because mm. eventually war was, you know, come to the end after five years. And, uh, you know, I say, I need to think now my future. I want to do something better. I just yeah, don't want to be the, you know, in, in special forces, you know, I mean, just, just combatant. You know? I mean, I just want to, I want to be full of the medals, you know. <laughs> so you felt yourself like you wanted to accomplish more in terms of your military services and how did you find throughout that process you evolved in form of your mindset mm. where you started to notice things that when you were in the military where you were focusing on your tasks your objectives and getting things done and focusing on, for example, you have great time management skills. How's that helped you in that process during that time? I was always amazed what human body can endure. You know, I remember, I always say, this is my book. Late November was a start snowing. I was very, very cold. It was like a minus five, six degrees, yeah. And we were still in summer uniforms, man. Summer uniforms. You know, I used to be don't, didn't have a shower myself for days. You know, there's no what, you know. You have the, some type of life when you go back in the city for the R&R, &R, relaxation, you know, to, to, to be with family, whatever it is. I had nobody. So like, you know, just by myself. Yes. And, you know, you, there was no hot water. So you put all cold water in the bath, you know, and pretending it's a, it's warm, you know, just take the dirt and everything from you. So first I need to learn to how to deal with the fear because war is not normal, right? You know, I mean, particularly when you're very young, towards the December 91, my unit was decimated, literally decimated because there was a more funerals than, than new people coming. So we started receiving the 
people 60 plus years old with a stomach cancer, lung cancer, brain cancer. Wow. Yeah, like it was just it was just people who who you know did nowhere to go. Like you know what I mean. So they were sitting with me in a in 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 the trenches. You know what I mean because there was become static war. Like more, we were losing war, but it was a static war. We were defending something because we just there was a more moments in my life. I just said to myself, just come, you know, just 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 take me. I can't handle this anymore. There was a then love question. I mean, because I was being dumped a few months before, so. Then I need to learn how to live my life, you know what I mean? How to stay healthy in a war. It's not just to survive into war, but I don't want to sit on a cold rock, you know, I mean? because I get, you know, I get hemorrhoids, you know, I don't want to drink alcohol because it's not good anymore. But but that stage I was very heavily em- embedded with alcohol, drugs, smokes. I was just a n- 19. I was ready. First time I was shooting the heroin in my veins, you know what I mean? Wow. Yeah, it was just, it was there. You know, the government provides you. My unit was being provided. There was Marlboro Raid, you know, was very expensive smokes, you know what I mean? Here we go. So in the war, everything's there, just don't. Then I start realizing people around me, I was become grateful I have no wife or kids because I saw most of my comrades, the wife left them, you know what I mean? For some rich guy somewhere in Germany, <laughs> in Hungary, as a refugee there because most of the people run away from my city yeah. as a refugee. So on your question, I need to learn. I need to learn many things in order to survive. So, like, the I have a good mentors in the military as well. I have some previous knowledge, so I rely heavily on our senses. You know, which is you can see it, you can smell it, you can hear it, you can touch it, you can taste it. So that was my guidelines. That 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 the senses mm. because. You know when you feel something's not wrong, something's not wrong. You know what I mean? I something is going to be terrible wrong. <laughs> you know when you know that if I touch this mobile phone, I'm going to burn myself. Just example, I figure yes. a speech. I'll not touch this one. But then comes the time of the peace, and we had the expression "enjoy the war" because when the peace comes, it's going to be it's going to be horror, and it's true. Because suddenly you have this, you need to switch from the being combatant to being the ordinary citizen. For me, that was not an option. So I was being sent to many schools by my unit, my commander, my general of the corps, and I landed job in military police, right? Because mm. it was sort of come to the end. And uh, I showed the uh, skills in interrogations and investigations. And I was very young. I was 25. Can you imagine? I was lieutenant, 25 years old. Still a baby. Yeah, yeah. I mean, still, you know, no sex, nothing. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine the <laughs> sacrifices you need to make, but it's such a humbling experience at the same yeah. time what you have to go through in order to do things for a bigger purpose than just yourself. And that's such one of the most remarkable things about you being able to go through that at your young age at the time. I think everybody can do this. You know, yeah. when I see my son, my son is 21 years old now, 22 is going to be in two months time, three months time. I said to, you know, to his mother, I said like, you know, I'm happy he doesn't need to go to that ordeal because, you know, I see the pictures when I was 21, I was already being wounded twice in my back and my head. I had no hair. My 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 face was look different. Um, I was looking very old. Um, the, the, there was no life in me anymore, right? Because, yeah. You know, we were a country, we wanted our freedom, we wanted our independence, but one third of the country has been occupied, international sanctions. Uh, then the war broke out in neighboring Bosnia, which is dragging Croatia even more into war. Like, it was a lot of sacrifices. And I learned, uh, I was in one school in France, I can say that much, and I don't remember. I was being sent for three months training. And... I remember on a entry to Kasarna, the army barrack says, "Sweat saves blood." I say, "What the?" F-? You know what I mean? I was just mm. I couldn't couldn't care less. And then I realized actually that it was good that my government sent me for all this education. That night I was we were on a level three. That night about two three o'clock in the morning, the people walk in the room. They put balaclava on my head. They tied up my hands behind my back. They were hitting me. They were they were they were punching me, rolling me down the stairs. You know, I just want to die. And they all wanted my name. I give you. They give you everything. Just give me the name. And I said, I give you fucking nothing. You know what I mean? You know who I am. 
know. Yeah, like, and you know, I think if they bash me another few minutes, I will give up, give up everything because next stage of that that process was they put your head in this metal barrel, mm. you know, the 200 liter diesel barrels filled with the water, mixed with that old diesel, and they're shooting next to your head. You know, what I mean, like next to your ear. You know, what I mean. Give us your name. That's crazy. <laughs> oh man, you know what I mean? Just and then I realized that was pro- selection process. Who can stay or be there, right? You know what I mean? So I realized myself. I said, if I enjoy this, I can do more things. And life is always full of the surprises. You know what I mean? So it is, yeah. and we never know what's around the corner at the end of the day. So we we'll always have to be alert and aware and focusing on what's in front of us so i noticed when i was looking in your other room you have a rosary and i was curious about your faith when did you actually turn to faith was it during the time when you're in the military or was it afterwards i was never being the the man of the faith you know like i do remember at age seven i um i was being bullied a lot so you know i was living with some my own my own World imagination, right? Nice. You know what they say: you attract what you are. <laughs> you attract the rubbish you'll be. <laughs> it's like, so at age seven, I attracted very bad people, right? You know, I mean, my life, who they bullied me, but I was happy with them because I was accepted. That's very masochistic, right? You know, I mean, they're, they're bashing you, but you with them because they're accepting you for who you are. Yeah, exactly. So maybe some type of love, whatever it is. You know, what I mean. But I remember at age seven or eight, I will lie to you right now because look, you need to forgive me. I'm older man. <laughs> Okay, what happened? So, shopping center was shutting down at 8 p.m. We hide ourselves into furniture, right? So, we, when the lights turns off, we turn everything on in the shopping center, right? That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you were hiding and then from there, that, that's hilarious. It, it kind of reminds me of a TV series I saw, but it's like off topic. It's... Yeah. I don't know if you watched, what was it called, The Last of Us? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. they snuck into the shopping yeah. mall and they turned everything on. <laughs> yeah, that the two girls, you know. Yeah, the they, two yeah, girls. Yeah. I think the show is coming this November. Yes, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. season two. Season two, yeah. So what we did, you know, I mean, like, was so, so stupid. But, you know, when you're there's a one security guard in communism, you don't do that those things, right? Just mm. Anyway, so I know I need to be at home by 8 o'clock, but I'm not at home. So is it with these boys? So in your head, you try to, you know, try to excuse us everything else. So we start eating and drinking, but we fall asleep, right? We fall asleep. Yes. And in the morning, there's a police above us, you know what I mean? And, and all these employees, like, look at the mess we did, right? <laughs> so I start running out. So I forgot, you know, we, we just eat everything. You know, that was mostly eat food. And uh, I was running out, and um, I saw the church, so I want to hide myself from police because religion was not forbidden in communism, but it was not welcome. If you believe in God and you don't believe in a party, that's not good, you know what I mean? That makes sense. Yeah, so I ran into church, and uh, there was a um, scripture class, right, you know what I mean, which is volunteer in communism. Not many kids. I run inside. They was they were watching the movie about uh, Jesus Christ or something, right? Mm. I run inside, all all bloody and messy, and the, the nun she saw me. She says, like, "Oh, go inside." Police was on the door. She says, "Nobody's here." I said, like, "You can check." And the police was like, "You know, if they go inside, it's it's gonna be a lot of tensions." But that's what they did. You know what I mean? Anyway, mm. and uh, I met this priest. His name is Mate. And uh, I become the altar boy. So when I was in wow. church, I become altar boy. I was very, very open to learn, to to follow the footsteps, everything else. But as soon as I'm out of the church, man, Robin Hood idea. You know, I mean, I can do this. I can steal. I can do this. And that's eventuated into the you know stabbing a few years later. Something. Yeah, it's interesting when you turn the face. I know personally through my experience. I've always had the most peace when I'm with the Lord, when I'm with yes. God, praying to him on a daily basis, going to church, reading scripture. There's a unexplained peace and love you have in yourself and for other people. And you no longer go through that pace of 
oh, I don't like this person, I don't like that person, but you have a different type of love for that person. And that's what I got from my faith. I share something with you. So like, yes. I believe in God even today. Yes. Absolutely. No question asked. I'm the Roman Catholic and I can't say I saw the God, but I, I felt the presence of God many times. And I tell you what it is. When the war broke out in Croatia, uh, it was uh, settling old scores from First World War, Second World War, right? You know, And once upon a time, we were being sent to the ambush in enemy village. So you get to lunch about one o'clock in the morning, you get big lunch, uh, three o'clock in the morning was a morning. The reason why you have that this food, heavy food before the combat, if to the uh, to digest before the combat, see, still have energy, yes. but if you shot in the stomach, you will not die because the most injuries in, in a war, like if you hit in stomach, you have the food, you're gonna get a sepsis. I mean, straight away, blood poisoning, you die. That's yes. what it is, you know what I mean? And um, every time before the before that we go in a combat, they will come the priest and share the rosaries. You know what I mean? So when we went on um, ambush that morning, following day, we were just um, you know you, you can you can feel the breathing of the enemies. They didn't know that so close we are. You know I mean, we were after one man, one man alone. And their priest was orthodox, giving the rosaries and all these things. And I, when we come back. I asked a question, and um, they said to me, what, what is it? So I could say, who, who's, who, on whose side of God it is? I was being reprimanded straight away because I questioned authority. Yes. But then in a war, um, one thing I saw when the man before will die and I will hold them, they will ask for the mother, right? But the one thing will follow us. They, so every man before dies, he's asked for his mother. But then think next thing, I can see the smile on the face. Like you, know, I, you can see the people in the agony with our limbs, you know what I mean? The, the pain. But you see the smile on the face and, you know, they say, God, thank you. And they, they're talking to something, somebody. And I mean, like, I can't explain to you. I so, understand. And then you can check this. I have the goosebumps now. So when I was progressing my career, I was being sent to the police academy to learn forensic investigations, right? That was my of my jobs for military uh, service. I was, I need to learn this craft, six months. So we went for the um, autopsies. <laughs> my, I, I can't. But you learn all these different type of the deaths and, you know, how they, how they started, how they ended, you know, the um, how they... Pain was inflicted, how the life was taken, all these things. But one thing I remember, this lady, that's how I met my my first wife. She's an anesthesiologist. The one thing it is, they don't, they can't explain what's happening when they open the heart. There's some liquid that comes out of the heart. There's, even today, they can't understand what that liquid does, what is in the heart. Mm. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, you give me the, my scotch and coke. You know, like, <laughs> smoke. Like, but... As I was coming out of the war and going to some ordeals, and my son is the one thing. I uh, always say this, my son was diagnosed in 2008 with epilepsy, in a moment when my marriage was crashing, GFC, we lost the jobs, lost the home, we become homeless, it was like, it was a, it was a nightmare. I said to God, I said, look, I just, I wanna make a deal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. And there's a particular church in Croatia where I'm going, so despite all, you need the money to travel, right? So even yeah, I had no sure. money, I managed to go in that church, which I showed my son two years ago, he was with me in Croatia, so like, you know, that's a church I'm going there, and I prayed. And my son, he did have surgery, and even doctor said, you know, he's the one in a million kids. He said, it's a miracle. And so like, mm, it's not up to me, it's up to God. So. People can say to me whatever they want, but I say like I saw the God being the last thing Muslim men who will die will talk to something, somebody. I couldn't understand. And there's other things I noticed. But I can't say, yeah. Henceforth, I truly believe that there's a, the presence of the, of the Lord. And whoever believes in whatever they believes, I don't care. I believe in what I believe. That's beautiful. And... It's amazing how in times of suffering, we tend to find the Lord in 
the ways we set our path and sometimes when we experience what your son experienced and you pray to God he always answers especially in times of need and he does perform his miracles like he did in the past and it kind of reminded me of a story a bit earlier when you were first mentioning it about the war yeah how people were praying and there's two examples that I love to bring up, which was one is in the Bible of Joshua, mm. in the book of Joshua, where the this um, land was in war with Israel. Mm. And the angel came down and Joshua said to the angel, whose side are you on? And the angel said to him, I'm not on either side. I'm on side with the Lord. You see, this is, this is something I always... I realized it evolved very quickly. Henceforth, when people said to me, alpha males, all of this, might shut up this in your in your menu daily, that you're the alpha male, the killer. In a war, I saw that most of the guys at my first unit, you will believe it or not, it says in my book, so I was in a special forces or ministry of interior. And I got all criminals, police going into prison, so there was abolition. If you government's gonna ab- abolish all your you know deeds, you need to join to the force to fight. And I will say one in ten will say yes. The criminal is not stupid. They go, I'm, I'm happy in the prison. You know, just go there. You know what I mean? But then I realized that most of the people I was, they were around me during the war. They were ordinary people like yourself and I. Yes. All these alpha males and everything. Blah blah blah. But then comes the, the scariest part. In life, we all gonna hit something, somewhere, somehow. It's a wall, it's an obstacle, and it's gonna come to the what we value most. Most valuable commodity in life is the health. Mm. And when I was going with my son, what I was going through, and I must say his mother, she was always the upfront. I wasn't. I was afraid. I was a mm-hmm. coward. My son has a surgery. I always say these people know. The moment they take him in, I, I run away from hospital. I run away. Wow. I was a coward, man. I was the biggest pussy in the world. And then, you know, you walk to the hospital. You know what I mean? I didn't want to be there. That's what I tried to say. Like, you know, I want to when he comes out. But then I was talking to the nuns again, incredibly. There was a kids down section in the Vespin Children's Hospital burn unit where the kids all the burn deliberately purposely or by accident and there is a the kids with the cancer right which I saw them before and I think myself now I see the people from public life on a TV who are the biggest killers alpha males you know where la 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 falling apart in front of my eyes asking God for something I think myself like but you're the first one who says we shouldn't believe in these things, you know. This, do you understand the predicament? Mm. So most of people will pray to God for the miracle when only when they need, and it doesn't work that way. It doesn't sure. work that way. That's the power of the faith. Faith is not only tested when you uh, have their own problems, but when people around you, that's a say to Justin, I wish I can print more of you, 10 or more Justins, to make the world a better place. I appreciate that, and I love what you said, and a lot of us just say the words Lord, Lord without meaning and a lot of us neglect building a relationship with God. And once we learn how to build a relationship with God, as you know, that's when life's, life becomes more fruitful. And you you spoke about how a lot of people who pretend to be alpha males, but when it comes down to it, when they're put on the spotlight, when they actually have to perform, they are terrified. <laughs> And you obviously have a business where you expose a lot of these fake gurus. Yes. And I've had experience running a old podcast with one of my mates where we got to interview a lot of these influencers yeah. slash gurus, but finding out what they do behind the scenes in order to grow isn't true. And it's all for show. Yes. So give us your insights with those people that are today that are promoting themselves as gurus, influencers, and trying to lead those people in a path where they're misleading them. I'll go without names, right? So I'll put this perspective. 
there comes a public speaker from from um, America. He fills twenty one thousand people into the biggest arena, and the humans can say up to four hundred words per minute. They can understand one hundred twenty five. They can hear one hundred twenty five words, but twenty five words you can understand. When you have a public speaker who comes from U.S. and fill twenty one thousand people, and they go with all this charisma and everything else, I said to myself, "Oh, my, it's a bullshit." Because when you have the gurus, you can't appeal to everybody equally. Same that guru particularly. I'll say his name, Tony Robbins. Yes, right. Guy has no schools, okay, but he's teaching us how to live a life. It doesn't work that way for me personally. I was a bad student, but lucky for me, I met a later stage in my life, thankful to him, Professor Clyde Smallman, a professor, Dr. Troy Whitford. They both put me in a path to be educated here in Australia. And I was the first one who said that's not possible. They said to me, for what you want to do, you need to have some credentials. It's not just opinion. So you have uh, 21,000 people come on Tony Robbins. This is my opinion, nothing to do with nobody. Yes. I went there and I feel sorry for every and each person. You know why? Because they hear the 125 words, there's a hype, but Tony Robbins doesn't say, how many of you has a university? How many of you speak English? How many of you don't speak English? How many of you want this or that? But he does a carpet bombing and that's what it is. It's a his profit, not yours. Three days later, it was like, yeah, the Tony Robbins. Now, go to the gurus. Pay me forty nine ninety five per month. I'll make you a millionaire. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. So you have a blueprint for everybody again. It doesn't work that way. I always say to people, take it with a big grain of salt, anything, what you see, what you hear it, and ask for credentials. You see, yes. in your conversation with you, you said to Mario, I need to sacrifice 10 years of my time, whatever, sorry, apologies, at age 17 to become the uh, Komal Games. This is what I did. People can check. All these gurus, they're selling your dream, wrap it in a right rib in a red ribbon. So my dream becomes your product. Hey, come on, man, seriously? It doesn't work that way. So I'm investigated many of these gurus who are hiding even today uh, as far as possible they can. Uh, they owe people a lot of money and uh, they, they collapse it. And as I say, the more difficult situation it is, more uncertainty drives the fraud and scam. And I say to people, in a nutshell, if you really want somebody to be a guru, ask them, sign me here, Justin, that you are going to learn from you how to do wrestling, how to do conditioning, how to do this. Can you sign it? You're going to say, of course, Mario. I'll supervise you. That's accountability and responsibility. Yes. But when you go online and the guy with the blue eyes, the urban monk, Jay Shetty, right? Jay yeah, Shetty yeah, has yeah. been exposed in the match. He's still, he's in hiding. He's still in the hiding. I mean, the guy was stealing other people quotes mm. and portrayed them as a day on. He admitted, I'm thinking myself like, Dude, you took millions of dollars of the people on their misery. So, okay, you want to go with these gurus? Go. Go, 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 go. But you are going to investigate and it's going to be happen to you. Remember, I done this uh, lady, I forgot her name. She's um, from Melbourne a few years ago. She she beat the four, uh, four deadliest cancers in 15 days with the vegetarian food. Oh, wow. I forgot her name, and it was just his day, right? You know what I mean? Anyway, she's from Melbourne, and she, the media, portray her as a one of the of the leading experts on naturopaths. You know, he can cure the cancer with the food and everything else. Turns out she has a GoFundMe. People give the money to that lady. You know what I mean? Mm. But what she what she was selling to people, and this is what I try to people understand. She told other people who die from cancer that she can cure them just by eating the carrot, and People believe in that, that they died in agony. But some people couldn't afford her up and they died. So if you want to somebody make money on your misery, go for you. But the thing it is, yeah. It's interesting because I had this conversation yesterday with my friend who is a personal trainer who's 
looking to be an online personal trainer, but he's looking to do things the right way, where he's getting himself an education, it's the ready PT, getting himself certified as a dietitian and other credentials, but he sees other personal trainers that are not doing that, and they don't even put themselves to being qualified as personal trainers. That's they haven't cool. even done a course. And because they know how to market themselves well, they understand that a lot of people will only have a attention span of three seconds and everyone wants a quick <laughs> fix. And it's so easy now to get people to buy your product even though you're not legitimate, right? For those people that tend to sell their courses and they're not even like well-educated in that subject. I was on one course, I want to learn how to write a book. And uh, I went to that course and said like, okay, it's a celebrity course for the books in Queensland. It was the biggest scam ever. And I was a part of that scam, you know what I mean? Because I learned nothing except how to scam the people. That's a scam. Mm. So they teach us how to take the picture with some celebrity and put it in the cow page. They're going to arrange this one. How to walk on red carpet. Okay, whatever, you know what I mean? Oh. And how to portray ourselves, how to do the reel for the, our website and everything else. So everything was a scam. And as I said, like, I will walk there because um, what most of these gurus and coaches don't understand, that on that part, they will destroy their lives. There was a Canadian guy, Patrick Rana, I done an investigation about him. What he did for 20 plus years, um, he was being in... Um, Together with this lady uh, Maria Duval from uh, French, from France, she was a psychic, literally psychic. Mm -hmm. He was her name, and he was creating the letters, letters, literally letters. You pay me uh, fifty bucks uh, per month, I give you the lot of numbers and everything else, and so oh, on. Wow. So yeah, people are paying money. So he saw he made so much money. He spent all this money. It was a scam. It was a lie. It was a, you know. But people believe in this because the people want to attach themselves to something. That's what you and I talk about. In the moment of the darkness, there's nobody there except you. You know, I've been, um, you know, you've been in your life as well. When things doesn't go right, you know what I mean? Everybody everybody dumps you, you know what I mean? Everybody says to fuck off. I've been in that position so many times. I've been in my life more times in position, try to please others more than please myself. Mm -hmm. I would do everything to be accepted by the many, not by myself. And I think myself, like, what the fuck am I doing? You know what I mean? At the end of the day, I saw why the war, you know, done these things, are given knowledge by true experts, and I'm ignoring that. So this Patrick Duval, what he did, people are making uh, effort, pay him 50 bucks, 100 bucks. Eventually, one girl, she's, uh, she got a letter in England, the girl, literally girl. That's how everything started. If you don't pay $500, you know, you're going to die. And she couldn't find the money, and she jumped from the bridge because she's going to die, right? Wow. And that's how it started. So I tried to say, like, as long as I breathe, I'm going to utilize my knowledge, investigations, interrogation, and I will expose you because... You will not get the life sentence of celebrity, but you'll get the life sentence of the liar by being branded by society. Because 100%. you can make a money. But what I try to say like that's what they're teaching you. They don't you know this. You you done it, your wrestling and all these things. Those skills are being built over time. You don't get them overnight, but somebody says to pay me forty nine dollars. Seriously? I mean, sorry, ooh, football. Okay. I need to take the notes as well. <laughs> no, it's great. And I, I love this saying it's the bodyguard. The truth is covered by the bodyguards of lies. Mm. And obviously, a lot of the lies are going to cover the truth. So a lot of people don't actually see what's actually happening with the bodyguards of lies. And it's a famous thing we talk about in like scripture class mm -hmm. in terms of yeah. like trying to find what is the truth and what isn't the truth. But it made me think of this famous YouTube show. It's called The Con Contrapreneur. Contrapreneur, okay. So yeah. he does like Contrapreneur Bingo. And he like has like this list of things that a lot of entrepreneurs do. People who con people. I'm selling my course for $97. Are uh, they start doing this pitch, doing this pitch, this pitch? And here he gets the full list. He says bingo. But he also done this thing where he had like an Amazon book, right? Yeah. And it was just like how to sell an Amazon book and it was blank pages. It's mm. like, this is a scam. This is a scam. This is a scam. And it became a Amazon bestseller and he was trying to prove a point. 
anyone can be an Amazon bestseller. Because it's like, you know, we live in, we live in that culture where this being yes. approved, but you know what I mean? Like, I, I will not approve this because like there's an, there's a, is a ordinary people who work freaking hard. They want a better life. Of course they want a better life. You know, when someone says to me, I'm a millionaire, you want to be a millionaire, first thing to learn definition of what millionaire it is. That's mean that you have the more money than, you know, not to owing on the assets and the credits. Let's basically what it says like, you have no owings, you have $1 million yes. in account. Who has that lifestyle? Seriously? Andrew Tate, I mean, he's a con artist. Andrew, I mean like, you know, if you want to take this out, take it. I said Hello. to myself, Andrew Tate, my the dude, like you know, talking to me like how he's great, you know, how he's alpha male, man, seriously, you know. But then you see that his audience is a 14, 15, 16 year old kids. These kids will do everything and anything to become millionaires. You see, they don't mm-hmm. see you being a court. Once when you caught, you're branded. You go in a court. You have a criminal record. You know, you think you're a celebrity. No, you're not. You're gonna be put into a position where you're going to suffer more than, than you have the position that you can mm-hmm. enjoy the life. And that's why I say to people, nothing good doesn't come overnight. Yes, that's It true. takes a lot of sacrifice as you did and you're a true example of this. And look at the, you know, Mr. Beast, you heard for him? Yeah, yeah, I know Mr. Beast. Look at him like, you know, he making millions. Now he's been exposed left, right and center. Nobody wants him anymore. What is it? We have to fly here. Yeah, 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 like a mosquito. Yeah, yeah, like trying to focus on you. like seeing the mosquito fly by, but 100%. And yeah, like I can resonate with mm. a lot of people who I've met that are doing these things and conning people, and it's unfortunate. But yeah, tell us about when you went through the journey of wanting to do the Guinness World Record in 2023. I'm not a ordinary guy i just love love i love challenges in life you know if you don't have challenges you know i think myself that's that's not me you know so i was on radio um and i think myself i want to do the guinness world record one way or another so what best than to create a legacy in which you know you can inspire the people and i mean and look guinness world record it's not something very easily been it's not many people do that these things very expensive number one secondly i choose something which requires no three days no sleep it was a lot of preparations um i have a good uh, good crew like a uh, roy Padlan was the then chairman of the alarm 90.5 graham mcfarland you know there's a people there who stood up by me uh, and um, a lot of people let me down actually you know because i need to make a roster and submit who's going to come for interview because it was a continuous live audio broadcast if you are silent more than 30 seconds, disqualification. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there's no, I want a little bit, <laughs> Nina Nana, and I put the music or these things. No. So I was surrounded with the good people who were there with me for four and a half days. Wow. Um, yeah. It was the biggest challenge, but it's one of the biggest accomplishments that it can be done. You know what I mean? And in that part, that way, I proved the people again that impossible is possible. I planning another Guinness World Record next year. I can say only that involves the space, jump, speed of sound. <laughs> and that's, that's I can say, for this moment. So that doing next year, another one. So. That's incredible. And yeah. you have done many great things and you continue to do great Thank things, you, which Christian. is amazing. And for those people that are wanting to follow a similar journey to you, what advice would you give to them? Just follow your heart. Believe in yourself. Eh? If you don't believe in yourself, nobody will believe. I always say to people, if you don't believe in you, nobody else is going to believe in you. I always believe that I should be surrounded with many people and I'm happy now surrounded with the less people. I learned more my lessons mostly on my losses than on my wins. And stay humble, stay, stay humble because we are li- on limited time on our journey on this planet Earth. And that's nobody understand. And I think that you and I, we are here for the reasons and we need to teach people around us, you know what I mean, to excel us. And I say like, someone's going to be better than me, he should be better than me. I see my son, he's a 10 times better man than I could ever possibly dream about. Mm-hmm. And that makes me happy. That's phenomenal. Thank you. And if you could, last question, yeah. speak to yourself when you're eight years old mm-hmm. now, who you are, 
What advice would you give to yourself? Believe in your dreams. It's it's okay to be daydreamer. Even today, I do daydreaming. Um, believe in yourself. Eh? You know, don't worry for the world saying around you what you know. You owe nobody apology. Just do above the law, and uh, you know what I mean above the board and uh, according to law. That's it. Just push forward. I just want to thank you again for coming thank down. You. It was a great interview. We thank did you. two episodes in a row, ah. which was a good two hours. So. We Bravo. are best friends now. Like you hey! said, that's it. That's <laughs> it. And I uh, thank you for these two books as well. Thank we you. Can't wait to actually yeah. dig into them and yeah, get to know more about your personal life as thank well you as your so professional much. life. Really appreciate. Really appreciate. Thank you for having me on your podcast, Justin. No problems. Until next time.